Welcome to this podcast from Neurogastroenterology and Motility. It publishes original research and topical reviews on basic and clinical aspects of gastrointestinal sensation and motility, as well as brain-gut interactions. It is the official journal of the American Neurogastroenterology and Motility Society and the European Society of Neurogastroenterology and Motility. So welcome everyone to this month's uh, podcast from Neurogastroenterology and Motility. My name is Dr. Adam Farmer. I'm a consultant gastroenterologist at the Wingate Institute in London. And it's my great pleasure today to welcome Professor Peter Kourilis. Peter needs no introduction uh, to the field as he's one of the key leaders uh, in esophageal uh, manometry. Uh, Peter's a professor of medicine at the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern University in Chicago. He joined the Northwestern faculty in 1986 and served as division chief for seven years until 2006. His research is on esophageal and oropharyngeal physiology and pathophysiology, topics on which he's had NIH funding for the past 28 years and published an amazing 290 original papers. He's currently an associate editor of the American Journal of Gastroenterology and is a sitting member of the NIH GI study section. In collaboration with the Chicago Group, he's recently published the third iteration of the classification of esophageal motor disorders. Peter, welcome to the podcast and uh, many congratulations to you and your co-authors on a, on a super publication. Thank you, Anna. So if I could start off, could you give us some history and background to, uh, to high-resolution esophageal manometry? Sure. Uh, this was a technology that evolved in the 1990s, uh, largely through the efforts of um, Dr. Ray Klaus at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, there were some other early experimenters as well, uh, notably uh, John Dent's team in Adelaide. Um, but it was really Ray Klaus who applied this first to, to the study of um, peristalsis. Uh, unfortunately, Dr. Klaus um, passed away prematurely in uh, 2007, but not before he was able to introduce, in collaboration with uh, Sierra Scientific, which was a startup technology firm, a um, manometric uh, apparatus that was suitable for clinical use, and uh, it was that innovation that really introduced high-resolution manometry to the clinical domain as opposed to the research domain, and that occurred roughly 2004. I'm not uh, I'm not sure if it was a year before or after that, but it was roughly that time when Sierra started selling high-resolution manometry systems. And the uptake on that was a little slow at first, but uh, the the attributes of the technology um, became very apparent to uh, to the academic community, and from there it, it spread actually fairly quickly into the clinical domain, to the point where now it's the dominant uh, manometric technology in the United States. And certainly, and I think so elsewhere. Certainly, I think uh, that's the same in, in Europe as well. Um, perhaps for some of our listeners who, uh, who are not so uh, au fait with uh, high-resolution esophageal manometry, how does it differ from standard manometry? Well, the reason it gets called high-resolution is because it's employing a lot more pressure, pressure sensors uh, spaced a lot more closely. And that's a technical aspect of it. The obvious visual aspect of it is that rather than uh, looking at motility as a series of line tracings, uh, it transforms it into what's known as pressure topography, which is a lot more like a, a weather map where you're looking at isobaric contours because it's interpolating uh, between pressure sensors to get the complete pressure profile up and down the esophagus. And as a result, you can look at the pressure as a continuum from, from top to bottom. So it, it completely changes the way a manometric study looks. It, it now looks like a topography map instead of uh, a series of lines with upward deflections. And I think probably for some of the, the younger um, uh, doctors in the audience, I think it certainly eased our, our interpretation of, of uh, this aspect of uh, physiology. 
So how did the initial Chicago classification uh, uh, come about? Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Uh, the group in Chicago, uh, led by uh, myself and Dr. Pandolfino, were, were some of the early adopters of this technology, having actually worked quite closely with Ray Klaus. And with Ray's passing, um, we actually adopted the technology and, and took the lead in terms of uh, applying it clinically. So the first large series uh, of patients or published describing the, the, the pattern seen clinically was in, I just pulled this uh, reference, it was in 2008. There was a series of 400 patients and 75 controls. And we, uh, at that time, introduced kind of the, the, the key diagnoses that, that have evolved in high-resolution manometry. And it was the, the paper, paper was just titled A Series of 400 Patients and uh, 75 Controls. And it was actually Mark Fox who then called that the Chicago classification, which we were more than happy to, to accept. But, uh, in fact, uh, it, was, um, it was Mark Fox that, that first uh, uh, labeled it as such. And that became formalized in a meeting at DDW in uh, 2008, where the first meeting of the International High Resolution Manometry Working Group convened, and that was organized by Dr. Panolfino uh, and myself, but mainly Dr. Panolfino. And we invited uh, thought leaders from around the world to that meeting. And it was from there that version 1.0 more or less emerged uh, version 2.0 was the second meeting of this major meeting of this group, which was in Escona, Switzerland, I believe, in 2011. And then the third uh, came out of DDW 2014 uh, in Chicago uh, just this last uh, fall. So how do you think that uh, this classification and uh, high-resolution esophageal manometry as a technology per se has really redefined the field? Well, what it has done, um, or what it tries to do, is to objectify the interpretation of manometry in a numerical sense, to, to make it uh, much easier to learn and, and much more reproducible among observers. And it, it clearly succeeds in this. Uh, it's not perfect, nothing's ever perfect, but uh, the reproducibility of interpretation uh, and the transportability of studies is much greater with, with high-resolution pressure topography uh, presentations than it is with line tracing. Uh, it, it standardizes the methodology of obtaining the study, and it standardizes the methodology of interpreting the study. So, yes, there's still a learning curve on it, and you certainly have to spend some time to learn it, but uh, once you do that, you really should be able to um, reproduce the interpretations of experts. So what do you think are the key differences between uh, version 3.0 and the previous iterations? Well, I led this effort and the, the charge was to simplify uh, what we had presented in, in 2.0. Interestingly enough, the major diagnoses don't really change. The subtypes of achalasia, EGJ outflow obstruction, jackhammer esophagus. Uh, what does change are the precise criteria for defining these things uh, in that we've learned a lot since, since version 2.0 and some of the things that confused us in the past have become more and more clear. <coughs> Uh, so the precise criteria for the major motor disorders have been uh, solidified a little bit and changed. The biggest changes are probably in what are now called minor disorders of peristalsis, in that there were several subclassifications in version 2.0 that have all been merged into an entity called ineffective esophageal motility, which is... Um, adopted from conventional manometry to, to cover a lot of subtle abnormalities of peristalsis. So whereas we had been uh, 
subdividing these before. Uh, we didn't uh, we didn't continue to do that in version 3.0 because there's no real clinical difference in the management, and the idea here was to simplify this. So that's probably the biggest difference. Adopting IEM and uh, fragmented peristalsis is really the only two minor disorders of peristalsis. And how do you see these uh, criteria uh, impacting and, and refining what we do for, for our patients uh, presenting to our various services? Yeah, that's a key, uh, key question. And, and uh, the answer remains to be determined. I think the biggest impact of high-resolution manometry thus far has been an enhanced recognition of the various patterns of achalasia. And the benefit of that is that people who are not being diagnosed with achalasia before now are being diagnosed uh, with achalasia. And since this is the disease entity with, with the most clearly defined treatment paradigm, that's very important. Secondly, there's the entity of EGJ outflow obstruction, which kind of gets pulled into that, that uh, universe with a lot of caveats because uh, there are alternative explanations for EGJ outflow obstruction. And then thirdly is in the hypercontractility domain in clarifying the, um, the spectrum of spastic disorders into entities with premature contraction, which are a lot more like achalasia, and entities of hypercontractility, which likely will have a completely different treatment paradigm associated with them. And so what do you think are the key research questions uh, for the field as we move forward over the next five to ten years? Well, now that we've defined these uh, subtypes of achalasia and these subtypes of hypercontractility, uh, the charge is going to be to develop specific treatment paradigms for them. The first big step was to at least get a homogeneous population, and I, and I think this is the tool that allows us to do that. The next charge is going to be to define treatment paradigms according to these diagnoses, and frankly, very little work has been done uh, outside of achalasia in that domain thus far. So uh, with that, Peter, I'd like to thank you and your co-authors for, for another excellent paper, which I think is, is so useful uh, for, for clinicians around the world, as you say, in improving both uh, uh, reproducibility and reducing that uh, uh, intra-observer variability that's uh, been a real problem for us uh, in the past. So again, I'd like to thank you for as assisting with this month's podcast and also like to thank our listeners for tuning in. I look forward to welcoming you again on another instalment of the podcast in the near future. Thank you. My, my pleasure, Adam. Thank you. Further information about this paper can be found on the journal website. We hope that you have enjoyed this podcast and we look forward to welcoming you to next month's edition.